Okay, uh, hi everyone. I just want to say again, welcome to the class. I'm uh, excited to be discussing artist experience with you. And today I'm going to talk for a few minutes about uh, the, uh, the first chapter and some of the background of the book to help get our discussion started. Um, this, this is going to be a little bit longer than our typical pre-recorded -pre lecture, but I want to get us all oriented to the material. Um, so uh, as uh, we said before, John Dewey uh, lived from middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. Um, he was a philosopher of education, a philosopher of science and technology, um, political philosopher, and uh, the foremost uh, philosopher of American pragmatism. And um, he actually wrote pretty much on every area of philosophy you can think of. Um, he was a naturalist in orientation. Um, he was also a defender of the notion of participatory democracy. Um, he thought both education and science were um, governed or were a form of problem-solving inquiry. And he also developed a moral theory based in um, problem-solving, lived experience, and moral imagination. Now, in 1925, Dewey published a book, uh, Experience in Nature, the first uh, edition of it, and it was his major work of uh, metaphysics, a work that heralds the beginning of the so-called later works. Um, now Dewey surprised many of his readers by devoting the penultimate chapter of this book to art, the discussion of art. Um, he ends up arguing for an enormous philosophical significance to art, um, which he follows up on uh, fully almost a decade later with art as experience. Um, in that earlier work, Dewey ends the discussion of art by writing, experience in the form of art, when reflected upon, we conclude by saying, solve more, solves more problems which have troubled philosophers and resolves more hard and fast dualisms than any other theme of thought. Art demonstrates the gratuitous falsity of notions that divide overt and executive activity, from thought and feeling, and thus separate mind and matter. Well, as you start to look at the book, uh, you'll notice what we mentioned before, um, the indebtedness of Dewey to uh, Albert Barnes, uh, in both the dedication and the preface. Dewey drew a lot on um, the ideas of Barnes and his personal friendship with Barnes. Um, now, Art as Experience, the book, began life, uh, so to speak, as um, the William James Lectures at Harvard in the spring of 1931, um, uh, I guess winter and spring. Um, now, because of Dewey's close philosophical relationship to William James, um, the Harvard Department of Philosophy um, decided to give Dewey the, the honor of being the first person invited to give the William James named lectures. Um, and between that time, it took him about two and a half years before he uh, published them in early 1934 as Artist Experience. You can actually read a lot about that in the notes uh, to, the, to the Past Masters version of the book. Okay, so let's get straight to it uh, and talk about um, chapter one of, of the book, uh, The Live Creature. And this chapter, I think, begins with a really interesting passage. Um, Dewey says, By one of the ironic perversities that often attend the course of affairs, the existence of the work of, works of art upon which formation of an aesthetic theory depends has become an obstruction to theory about them. For one reason, these works are products that exist externally and physically. In common conception, the work of art is often identified with the building, book, painting, or statue in its existence apart from human experience. Since the actual work of art is what the product does with and in experience, the result is not favorable to understanding. The so Dewey's saying here that the existence of works of art, um, which presumably is the subject matter of philosophy of art, actually is an obstruction to, to producing a theory of art, to producing a philosophy of art. Now that's qu quite a striking um, claim for Dewey to make. Um, the reason he thinks that is is because uh, in, in common conception, as he says, we think of works of art as the physical things, right? The building, the book, the painting. Um, 
in their existence apart from human experience as an object in a gallery uh, or on the wall, right? Um, but, and this is a key uh, advertisement for uh, what's going to be so different about Dewey's theory, actual, the actual work of art is what the product does with and in experience, right? So because of this uh, ironic feature of um, the role of, of the physical artifacts in art, um, Dewey thinks we need to take a detour um, to examples of the aesthetic, not in art, but in, every, but in everyday experience. So, for example, uh, with respect to a fire truck racing by, or um, uh, men working on skyscrapers high above the city, um, to a simple thing as uh, looking at a, a fireplace or a campfire and poking at the, the, the fire. Um, these are everyday elements of experience that uh, have an, a, an aesthetic quality, right? Um, the woman in her garden, or the man, um, Dewey's references are a little gendered, um, unfortunately, um, uh, or the mechanic um, who takes particular care with, uh, with their tools or what they're doing. Um, also, the, the so-called low arts, um, movies, uh, what he calls jazzed music, uh, or the comic strip, are all examples for Dewey of um, places in our everyday life where something of the artistic and the aesthetic uh, actually plays a significant role. Um, these are examples of um, art that we're not likely to think of as art per se. Um, what we are likely to think of as art is something that's quite removed from everyday life. Um, this is what Dewey calls the museum conception of art, and, and the chapter brings a kind of central critique towards this conception. Um, according to this conception, um, art exists in a kind of separate sphere from everyday life, a remote niche. It not need, need not be literally in a museum, but often that means yeah, artworks are collected in, in some place, um, independent from any context of uh, the rest of our lives, displayed for pure contemplative, reflective uh, purposes, right? Um, often literally on a just blank white wall. Um, and this is a conception of art which Dewey thinks makes art um, uh, inaccessible uh, and uh, distant um, from, our, from our everyday lives. Um, the museum conception of art for Dewey is connected with the idea of art for art's sake. Um, a conception which might sound nice, art for art's sake, right? Um, but Dewey actually sees it as detrimental to both art and to everyday life. Um, uh, when they're separated from one another, everyday life is unesthetic, um, and art becomes um, unrelatable. Right? Um, and so also harms our ability to create a, uh, an adequate theory or philosophy of art. He contrasts in this way modern civilization where the museum conception holds sway with prior historical periods and other cultures where such everyday items um, as uh, uh, masks or weapons um, or uh, buildings um, of a political or religious significance um, where things like so ceremonial dress and ritual practices uh, or even something so mundane as, as pottery, um, everyday utensils, uh, as well as something, uh, or, or, or bowls or baskets, as well as the sort of spiritual surroundings that we find in um, religious spaces. Um, all of these are examples of art that is closely enmeshed with the places where we spend our time and the activities of our daily life. Um, and uh, Dewey thinks that modern civilization has gotten away from this, has gotten kind of cut off from this relationship to art. Um, 
In this chapter, Dewey uh, tells us that in order to really understand aesthetic experience, and remember, for Dewey, the work, the true work of art is what it does in experience, um, we actually have to better understand experience itself. Um, so that's where he's going to take us next. And luckily for Dewey, this is kind of the central, um, the central uh, set of ideas that he has explored throughout his philosophical career is related to the nature of experience. So Dewey tells us that the nature of experience is determined by the essential conditions of life itself. Um, and those are conditions that apply uh, as much for the bird or beast, um, uh, here's a cute beast, um, as it does for, for human beings. Dewey, um, already from fairly early work in the 1890s, has developed a conception of experience not as something that takes place in the mind or the brain of a separate individual, but as a product of the organism in close interaction with their environment. Um, uh, the, there's, a, there's a not a sort of sharp cutoff between what happens underneath my skin and outside my skin, or within my skull and outside my skull, right? There's a constant uh, interchange of material and energy across those boundaries that constitute human life, experience, and, and thought. Um, so that interaction for Dewey forms a kind of rhythm, a kind of dynamic tension between, on the one hand, disequilibrium or need or uh, problems, and on the other hand, equilibrium, satisfaction, um, unity. Um, you might think of it as uh, uh, like this, right? Um, any organism uh, will become uh, hungry, right? Or have a need for nutrition of some sort, um, and will engage in various activities of seeking um, or inquiring uh, or trying to find or even make food, right? In order to reach a, a, a situation of satiety. Um, and, but, but that, you know, that satiety, the lack of hunger, the satisfaction, uh, uh, of a full belly is never permanent, right? Um, there's always uh, conflict or loss or decay or change that pushes the uh, organism environment interaction out of that um, uh, unified or equilibrated state. Um, now interestingly, Dewey tells us that this is a feature of all experience, of all life, um, but uh, also that um, it is given uh, a kind of new quality by um, becoming more intellectual in character for, um, for humans, right? Um, the scientific inquirer for Dewey exists along this rhythm, right? And is particularly interested in, excited by, focused on the problems and the sort of upward slope of inquiry into how to find solutions, but is not sort of satisfied to stay there and is always kind of on to the next problem that arises. Whereas the artist uh, tends to um, live for those moments of, of satisfaction, that kind of unified experience. And um, although, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the artist does inquire, does have engage in that intellectual activity, the, they really are giving more emphasis to that side. That said, both the scientist and the artist travel uh, along this um, along this rhythm as, as much as anyone uh, as much as anyone does. Now our world, Dewey tells us, is a mix of both flux and change and disorder on the one hand, um, and form, stability, and order on the other. Um, order can emerge from that chaos, um, and it can be encouraged to do so by intelligent creatures. Um, and it's only in a world where both of those forces exist uh, that the tension between them can create an aesthetic experience. 
indeed all experience whatsoever or even the conditions of life uh, depend on the, the tension between the two. In a world of total flux, random chance, uh, no stability, there could be no experience, no, no art, and no, no life, right? Uh, likewise, in a universe that was finished, fixed, uh, completely stable, uh, again, the, the um, activities of life would not be possible, and so aesthetic experience would not be possible. So that's just some of the background and the ideas from the chapter that I find important. Um, I'm eager to hear what you think about chapter one and, uh, and where it takes us, and I look forward to our discussion. So I will see you in class.